fabulous show that, of course, I really enjoy talking to. I know they are two of your favorites as well. We've got Chris McIntosh right in the middle from Capitalist Exploits Weekly. Incredible research. And then on the right, we have Lynn Alden, the fabulous Lynn Alden, and her premium research paper. I'm sure all you guys have checked it out. But we want to do a couple things here. First and foremost, we want to go into an interview and get the thoughts from the experts and the pros as to what's going on right now in the markets. It is just insane. Markets down today, 1,800 points. Do we have another wave of the Cerveza sickness? Do we have a big blow off top because all these millennials are taking their unemployment checks and buying bankrupt companies <laughs> like Hertz? We're going to get into all that. But we really want to also announce the launch of Rebel Capitalist Pro. I've teamed up with both Chris and Lynn in this project. We're super, super excited about it. So after the interview, we're going to dive into that and we're going to explain it a little further and see how you might be able to participate in Rebel Capitalist Pro. But before we get there, Chris, let's start with you, buddy. What are your thoughts on what's going on in the market right now? Well, we're down in the major indices at least within the US but I have to say that I've never seen a I've never seen a larger disconnect between Main Street and Wall Street at any point in time I mean we have literally you've had the COVID virus which uh, or the lockdown should I say which decimated um, both supply and demand everybody's locked up and if that had lasted for a sort of three four week, week period of time we could have looked at that um, in a somewhat similar light to that of um, some sort of holiday. <clears throat> Although on holidays, obviously, people spend a lot of money at restaurants and bars and such. But so we had a fairly significant drawdown there, and that was likely to hit global GDP probably at least a couple of basis points. Um, but that's really now almost taken a sideline. It's, it's certainly within the US and even to a lesser extent now in Europe with um, Black Lives Matter protests and rioting that's just sweeping through um, city after city. And um, and so the amount of destruction that you're getting just in physical destruction of property and um, things like that is significant. And I think one of the things that, you know, I speak to a number of CEOs um, from clients of ours, um, from, you know, contacts around the world and you know, it's, it'd be extraordinarily difficult to find a CEO today that was um, bullish on the future and, and secondly, had an intention to up CapEx. So uh, the, the CapEx side of things is going to um, is going to disappoint massively. Uh, I can't see how it won't. And then additionally to that, um, you know, just the sentiment that um, exists um, in the market as yeah, there's just a, there's a significant disconnect between you know um, what 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 Wall Street is and and I guess the you know the the reason behind that is is when we look at what the Fed and the ECB and all the central banks are are doing, um, then one can make a justification for that. But you know that's um, that's that's kind of a separate question. I mean, I don't know what that. What are you thinking, Lynn? I mean, what are you seeing there? Uh, definitely similar. I mean, we've had this whole the whole like uh, you know pandemic shutdown crash, and then we had the the largest ever you know stimulus and uh, both monetary stimulus and fiscal stimulus come in, and it definitely seems in the past couple of weeks that the market took that too far, right? So all that stimulus helped to you know bandaid over the problem and helped to kind of reflate things a little bit and kind of stop the bleeding, but then the market started to price in that these things are fine now, right? We had the the pe what people took as a slightly better than expected uh, jobs report, right? But even though the jobs report was still awful and it had errors in it, uh, yeah. but the market kind of took that and ran with it. Uh, and so we had this large run up. Then we had all the, you know, the the retail trading activity come in. Uh, you know, it's kind of unprecedented levels not seen in 20 years at least. And uh, in the past week or so, we had, you know, one of the highest put to call ratio uh, you know, on record, right? So we had a lot of um, enthusiasm on the bullish side, especially the speculative side in terms of options. Can you explain that a little bit for the person who, who's not familiar with options? Yeah, it means basically a lot more people are buying uh, call options, which is a, a bullish speculation on the market than they are buying put options, which act, which act as hedges, right? So uh, generally, this is a very strong contrarian indicator, right? So 
uh, whenever that ratio, whenever there's a lot of people buying call options, it generally tends to be near market peaks. At least, you right. know, it doesn't, doesn't need to be a major peak, but a local peak. And whenever you have this kind of capitulation, everyone's buying hedges, it's because the market already went down a lot. And that's when you should think about maybe going long, right? right. So uh, we've had that kind of record, uh, you know, put to call ratio. Uh, so we had a ton of call option activity relative to puts. Uh, and a lot of that was driven by by small accounts. Uh, so we had this kind of fervor happen. Uh, but then, you know, this week we had the the Federal Reserve press release, right? So that even though they were a little bit more dovish than people thought, they also, they gave their forecast, right, for the next couple of years. And they, they're anticipating that this is going to take years to recover from. And I think the market was kind of forgetting that. They were kind of pricing that out and thinking that we're going to go into a, a V-shaped recovery right away. And I think the Federal Reserve kind of kind of threw water on that thesis. Yeah, you know, I I just want to, I don't want to click off this tab because I'm sure I'm going to screw it up, but I really want to go over an article I saw today and I actually used it in my whiteboard video. Just get your guys' feedback on this. Uh, it's from CNBC, <clears throat> excuse me. And it says many Americans use part of their coronavirus stimulus check to trade stocks, but that's kind of shocking. Okay. But it gets a lot more shocking when you read the bullet points say trading stocks was among the most common uses for government stimulus checks in nearly every income bracket the income bracket between 35,000 and 75,000 traded stocks about 90% more the week or excuse me they traded stocks 90% more than they did the week prior to receiving the stimulus check so and I did. I, I know that you've got to focus on facts and data, but I think from a psychological point, you you really have to start considering these factors. And I think looking at it from the opposite side, saying, okay, if this is the start of a bull market, that means that all these people that are taking their unemployment checks and buying bankrupt companies are going to be proven right in the long run. And I just don't see us looking at history or, you know, think fast forward 50 years and you've got a history book of this crazy bubble or the, these crazy times of, of COVID-19 in 2020. And in the history books, it says that's the time when all the high school students opened up Robin Hood accounts and just use pure emotion to get rich. Like, what are the probabilities of us reading that in history books in 50 years? I think there's actually, it's it's fascinating because, you know, you mentioned it, Lynn. You mentioned um, the, um, the, the put-to-call ratio and then the fact that you had this sort of bullish sentiment. And one of the things that I've noticed with running... Um, running a website where we've got you know everything from institutional people through to um, students and mom and pop and everything else um, and we have people querying us saying hey you know I'm interested in this service or whatever the case might be and we always tell them look you know this is kind of what it's for and this is who it's for and and there's there have been quite a few clients or potential clients who've come through and they've said look you know I've got a thousand dollars to spend um, and what do I do and um, and it's it's fairly clear to me that you've basically got um, you got two things. One is people have been locked indoors, and their income stream has been impacted. It's either been it's either collapsed to zero or it's been negatively impacted to some extent. And so you're trying to make up that gap, and you're saying, how do I fix that? And so you go, oh well, I'll you know, shit, I'm sitting in front of my computer. I'm going to try and do something. And and who's making money in this world? in a digital space, do I sell something online through Amazon or do I get on eBay and create some business? There's a whole lot of that happening right now. And really that's just the market, that's the capitalist market mechanism trying to solve a problem, right? Human beings are incredibly um, resilient and we will find a way to, to solve our problems. And so one of, one of the things I think that's happening at a broad scale, and this is not just, you know, US centric or, uh, it's it's literally globally, is that there are a lot of people looking at the financial markets and saying, there is something where I know people make money and I don't know anything, but I'm going to get involved, which is why if you look at Robin Hood accounts, the amount of Robin Hood accounts that are being opened is insane. Yeah. 
and that is all retail. Um, any, you know, I mean, it's like if, you know, for us on this call, you'd realize why we wouldn't use a Robinhood account. Your your um, fee, anyway, it's just a bad idea. But so I think that's taking place for sure. Um, which is, you know, when you when you look at, for example, like in the um, if you take any of the commodity markets, whether it's softs or, or metals or anything like that, we always pay a lot of attention to your commercials versus. Um, the rest of the market and the commercials are like almost always right, right? Those are the guys that are actually in the business of whatever it is, whether you, you've got a copper mine or whether you're trading orange juice or whatever the case might be. Those are your actual, um, you know, suppliers of of, those, of their produce. And so they'll know what their inventory looks like. They'll know what the crops are likely to be and they'll hedge, hedge their, um, their sales and their production, all that kind of fun stuff. And so, they they position accordingly in the market and and most of the time like well over eighty percent of the time they're correct and so you can actually often see that so I think this is a similar type of setup you know as Lynn pointed out where you've got this put to call ratio I think I I I haven't looked at it but I suspect Lynn that's it's it's not the quote unquote commercials it's more like the retail that are yep. that are heavily in that side of the trade yeah Chris were you in the business back in the dot com bubble. The dot com bubble was when I cut my teeth in investment banking in London. So I um, I came into it um, in ninety seven, and um, and you know I was telling Lynn this the other day. Um, you know, young um, entered into a world where I was like a junior nothing, and we were getting chauffeured around in limousines and first class business tickets and like i thought that was i was like oh this is just cool this is normal <laughs> until, <laughs> until like a few years later i realized holy shit this is not normal at all this is i just you know so um yeah how, how does this compare to then as as far as the the mania the retail investors look i it's very different you the the um That was a mania, like so. So that was greed driven. It was very, very greed driven. Um, what I think, to a certain extent, we're seeing now isn't so much greed. It's more of fear, and it's like, you know, where do how do I protect myself? And so, and, and how do I earn an income? And how do I, you know, I've, I've been impacted. I don't really understand what's going on, um, and I need to solve these problems. And this is one conduit where. You know, um, you know, human beings are linear. We we are we tend to have a linear thinking about the world, except we live in a dynamic world, and that's where things can come unglued at points of the cycle. So, in a linear thinking world, if you go back and you just look at the last 15, 20 years, you would say, well, stocks always go up, right. um, and and just it's I mean, it's like Druckenmiller it says it. You know, liquidity drives markets, and 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 he's correct. And so, a we do have a liquidity, um, you know, serious amount of liquidity are available. Um, and then, b you have this linear thinking where where individuals will say, well, what has transpired in the last five, 10, 15 years, um, and how do I participate, and how do I get involved in that? So, but I don't feel. I mean, I might be wrong, and, and um, you guys might have a different view. I don't feel like I like I'm seeing that incredible greed. I think it's more just trying to solve a problem and in wake of so much demand and supply destruction across every other space um it's it's like your your opportunities have been narrowed significantly if you're in if you're in retail you're you 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 have serious difficulties certainly if it's high street retail if you're in hospitality you have significant problems um if you're even and then and then of course if you're in real estate which is your background george if your real estate is synthetically tied to any of those so like if you if you had apartments or something of that nature that were you know in a um, in a in a little town or a little village that basically catered to tourism and coffee coffee bars and restaurants and things of that nature that side of real estate is impacted um, and then of course the the insurance companies that are um uh, in insuring those properties and the accountants that do the account like it just it flows through the whole sort of ecosystem so there's a lot of and i don't think this has yet been quantified by most markets there's a lot of 
um, of destruction across that entire value chain. And and then you say, well, where, you know, what is left? Um, you know, it's like if you look, and this is another thing. So the markets are up, but if you look at um, what is actually up, it's literally the top five. You know, it's Google, it's Facebook, it's Amazon, and it's not a surprise. I mean, it's not surprising to me that that um, Zuckerberg and Bezos are are championing um, the Black Lives Matter type thing um, because it's it's you know, it destroys retail. Like, who benefits? It's you know, um, you have to buy your stuff through Amazon. That's basically what you what you'll end up doing. You know, if your Sears go away and if your JC Penny go away and all those, that's great for for you if you're an, an online retailer. If every single shop in your neighborhood gets destroyed by looters and rioters. Then where are you going to go? You're going to go to Amazon. I I also don't think most people realize how long it takes those businesses to come back, even if they do have insurance to to pay for damages, it, they don't just come back immediately. You're not going to see those same businesses selling stuff in two or three weeks. And then consumer behavior changes. If everything in your neighborhood gets wiped out, you're going to go to the next neighborhood or you're going to go to Amazon and you might not go back when those shops open back up. Uh, Lynn, wh what is your take on that whole side of it, the demand supply side? Well, definitely, uh, the, kind of this, this train of thought happened when you uh, asked him to compare it to the 2000 uh, bubble. And one thing we've seen this time is that it's more broad based rather than tied to one sector. So, for example, rather than people just speculating on tech stocks, they've they've speculated on you know even bankrupt companies, as you pointed out, like it kind of airlines. yeah, airlines, <laughs> uh, you know, bankrupt companies, all sort of, uh, some of the shale. Uh, producers, like all sorts of things, and some of the tech stocks, right? So we've had this kind of broad-based enthusiasm, and it came at a time when people are at home, but receiving paychecks, they can't go to casinos, there's no sports to bet on, right? Mm -hmm. So we had sports bettors come over, we had gamblers come over, we had, you know, people open up accounts, not just Robinhood, but also at the at some of the other major brokerages, right? And we saw um, an uptake in trading activity starting in like 2018, 2019, when they started to do kind of free commissions. We had an already an uptick, but this year just absolutely exploded. It went up like fivefold, like the number of trades, just if you look at charts, just huge. Um, and then as it pertains to uh, the economy, definitely. So we have this demand destruction and then it's, uh, it's definitely top down, right? So many of the largest corporations, the, you know, the ones he listed are just, partially immune to it, right? Or even benefit from it. And then also, even among the companies that are impacted by it, larger corporations have more uh, ways to get capital and liquidity and to stay in business, right? So they they received faster aid, they received bigger aid, whereas smaller businesses had fewer options to get any sort of liquidity to stay in business. Uh, so they've been hit by a double whammy now. They had the, you know, the whole forced shutdown, uh, delay in liquidity, and then, yeah, now they have more uncertainty, especially in, in urban centers, right? Because you have the rioting, you have the looting. And any uh, businesses that were impacted by that, that's going to take a while to, to fully come back. And we don't know that this is over yet, right? We could have more waves of uh, rioting and looting, especially as we get closer to an election or potentially after the election, depending on how it goes. That's a whole other kind of tail risk to keep in mind. Yeah, especially when you consider the only tools the Fed has at their disposal will exacerbate wealth inequality. That, that's another thing that I think about that you just touched on, Lynn, is I, I just don't see how this social unrest can just go away. In my opinion, it's just, hopefully they'll, they'll take breaks, but it's just gonna get worse and worse and worse if the Fed is continuing to exacerbate that wealth gap by quantitative easing and just printing money. I think there's two things though, George, you've got, and, and Lynn, you touched on it, the wealth gap. So small SMEs basically didn't, or it was so difficult to actually get that, um, that you know, the stimulus checks and all that kind of yeah. fun stuff. Chris, if I could insert one thing, just so the viewers are following along. And I think, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but the reason was because the small businesses and mid-sized businesses actually had to go through their bank to access the funds. So they'd have to go through Wells Fargo. There was an intermediary where all these corporations could go almost directly to the Fed. There's literally just been a massive wealth transfer and it's interesting because what it's done is it's made the the, the big um, players 
um, it's it's widened that wealth gap. You know, the big players will survive because they have access to credit. For starters, they had access to credit that small businesses don't going into this, okay? Secondly, they were then given additional help and support and they had access to that in a much, much more timely fashion. So where you've already got that credit, those credit lines, you could probably last for months without, you know, um, without dying. Whereas your small little, you know, fish and chip shop or something like that, they're literally on a, on a much, much tighter budget. Their margins are much slimmer. And so they were impacted more negatively. They didn't have the ability to get that capital in injection as much or as quickly as they should. And so a lot of them have gone bankrupt, which again is just, it's created an asymmetry with respect to um, creating more market share for the bigger players. And, um, and you know, this has all been brought on by, um, you know, by the Fed as well. And then if you, the, one of the things I've been talking to some clients about, I've got one client who's over in um, upstate New York, and um, and he had a, he's got a couple of restaurant um, businesses as well as um, as some other things. So he'll be all right. But on the restaurant side of things, he's literally just closing stuff down. And he wasn't going to on after the COVID thing. He was basically looking and waiting for things to you know open up and hoping that he could get the on back and everything else. And now because a lot of his stuff is in um, you know in cities which are experiencing rioting. Mm -hmm. um, and to his point, it's like a lot of this has just not even been um, on the mainstream media. They're, they're suggesting that it's, you know, fairly peaceful protest. And he's like, my stores are fucking looted. There's nothing left. Really? So, so then he's looked at it and he said, okay, do I, do I spend CapEx? Do I go back in? And he's answered that in the negative. And so I think we're going to see a lot of demand destruction that people are not quantifying just yet. Um, and he's not going to be spending money. He's not going to go back, and that's that's more unemployment because the people that he employed are not going to be, you know, going back. Um, and so that negative sentiment and that that inability to to spend capex and capital formation, I think, is just so important. If you think about how any economy works and functions, you need to have rule of law, and you need to have an ability to enforce that rule of law. And if you don't and in a legal court system. And if you don't have that, there is no incentive for capital formation. Yeah. Um, and that's that's one of the major problems that you have in, in many third world countries is that the rule of law is here and the you know the ability, for example, just to own your own assets and, and real wealth, um, property ownership and things of that nature is is you know a bit shaky. And so you're you you're not going to you don't have the same incentive to form capital. You look for something shorter term, just to buy something and sell it and try and make some money, which is why in a lot of African cities, you'll find people with their little shopping type carts and they're selling, you know, baked beans or, or whatever that is that they can sell on the side of the road because setting up an actual business takes capital formation and they're not sure if that, if they can actually own that property and if they can own the proceeds and so on and so forth. And I hate to say it, but I think we're seeing a lot of that underlying problems coming through in the US. I mean, if you were in Seattle right now, what would you think you'd be thinking about capital formation if you and I had a retail business in downtown Seattle? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Going back to your buddy, I mean, can you blame him? W would you take that 500000 that million dollars of your life savings to go back in and build things up when there's all these unknowns? And who knows what the taxes are going to be? Let's just say that you build things back up and the riots subside and everything's quote unquote back to normal to a certain extent, but then your tax rates increase. It it just um, there's and a George, lot that's of downside, not much upside. That's if you had the capital to go and spend, right? Many don't. Yeah. So Lynn, they, they're what, not in these businesses, they've got mortgages on them, and so they they basically run out of capital. So they have a solvency issue as well as. Um, this this uncertainty of demand going forward and an uncertainty of um, of rule of law. Yeah. So, Lynn, what Chris is talking about there, obviously, is you have this business just shutting their doors. So on one hand, that creates more unemployment. But on the other hand, it creates fewer goods and services. So looking at inflation versus deflation, how who wins the race? Does unemployment win the race or does the supply shock win the race to push prices up or down, consumer prices specifically? 
in the near term, we're seeing deflation in uh, discretionary goods, right? So things that people can choose to buy, but they don't have to buy, we're getting uh, more deflationary impacts. Whereas the essential, essential goods like food, especially because the supply chains are so specialized, right? So a lot of supply chains are optimized just to get food to institutional uh, places like restaurants and things like that. And then other parts of the supply chain are optimized to get food to grocery stores. And that that those supply chains don't just switch overnight, right? So uh, that's why I've heard stories about like farmers destroying their crops and stuff because they 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 are optimized to get it to a more restaurant focused uh, you know environment. Like mm. the way that they're the way that they package things, the supply chains they have set up, the people that they ship it to, they don't just change overnight and then ship all of their uh, products to supermarkets. So we are seeing uh, some inflationary pressures in some of the more essential goods, while we're also seeing deflationary pressures in some of the more discretionary goods. Uh, and uh, going back on the point about um, kind of the the wealth inequality that we're seeing, uh, both from from central banking activity and elsewhere, uh, one thing I've been warning about is that the U.S. is is in some ways uh, uniquely troubled by this because, you know, going back, it actually goes back all the way to the 1970s where we've had a rising wealth inequality. So QE came on the scene in 2008 and has been with us ever since pretty much off and on, right? So, but if you go back even further, uh, just all the different tools of monetary policy and fiscal policy, we've had this rising kind of wealth concentration and it's larger than most other developed countries, right? So that's what makes the US kind of fragile in the state where when we have like a shutdown and then we have double digit employment, when you already have that kind of, uh, you know, the bottom like 30 to 50 percent of the population is very uh, economically fragile, uh, and then you have small businesses closing. Uh, the U.S. is kind of uh, particularly fragile to this, and then especially when you add the fact that the U.S., uh, due to the strong dollar, the you know the global dollar uh, you know reserve status, we are more reliant on services and less on manufacturing than other countries. So we're tied mm -hmm. with like France in terms of how focused we are in services. And the, and the pandemic and then the shutdown that was, you know, mainly the shutdown around the pandemic disproportionately impacted services, you know, right. it, impacted, it impacted both because ultimately, uh, you know, there's not a lot of demand for some of the manufactured goods either, but it, it so far it impacted services more and the U.S. Uh, in many ways is more reliant on services as a percentage of GDP. Yeah. And the lower income groups are most likely going to work in the service industry exactly. yes. and therefore it just, it makes it even worse. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we, we understand that that's kind of what's going on right now and maybe the next month or two, three months. What do you think the Fed's response is going to be if the market continues to go down like we saw today and the, whether it's the concerns about a second wave or more riots? What do you think the Fed's response is going to be? I mean, it seems like they've done almost everything they can. Or are we going to see more fiscal response? At this point, I think the Fed, uh, they've used up a lot of their tools, right? So they're already doing, uh, they have rates at zero. They, they said they're not even thinking about thinking about raising rates. Uh, so then uh, they're mainly into asset purchases at this point and all sorts of different lending facilities. So I think uh, the emphasis uh, to look at is going to be more on the fiscal side. Uh, so the couple of dates to look out for is that uh, by the end of June, these small business loans that turn into grants, if you keep your employees on staff, uh, they kind of mature in a way. So people, the, the companies can start uh, letting those workers go if they don't have enough demand to keep them around anymore, right? They no longer have that kind of artificial incentive to keep some of their employees on payroll. So they might start trimming. So at the current time, we have uh, over 20 million continued unemployment claims uh, ongoing, right? So initial claims are still coming in. Some people are going back to work while other people are still getting laid off. So, uh, you know, we're officially down, you know, over 20 million jobs, uh, but then millions of people are only in the workforce because of these loans that are kind of keeping them tied to their employer. And it's kind of like a, another kind of backdoor unemployment uh, support system, right? Because they're still getting essentially unemployment checks through their employer because they're, you know, they're being kept on when they might otherwise be let go. Right. So that that comes to an end uh, in the end of June, right? So starting in the July timeframe, we have to see how that impacts the initial claims and the, you know, the unemployment rate. And then at the end of July, we have those extra uh, $600 a week in federal unemployment benefits. At the end of July, that expires, right? So we start to see kind of this 
high, potentially higher unemployment rate, uh, you know, to the extent that it's not offset by people going back to work. And then we see uh, that for the people that are unemployed, they could get a, a haircut in the income that they're getting while unemployed, unless we see more, uh, you know, more fiscal action from Congress and the president. And they are already talking about that, but we don't know what, what shape that's going to take. We don't know what the size is going to be. We don't know uh, if the two parties are going to kind of kind of go head to head on, you know, who gets the money and you know what they want to put in that bill. So uh, definitely through the July and August timeframe, I think that's kind of the key, uh, you know, to watch is more of the fiscal side. Especially when we get closer to the election as yeah. well. I mean, you, I, I would hate to. I mean, politicians are just the bottom of the barrel, as we all know. So they'll probably do this where the Democrats might just pull some tricks. Uh, I'm not saying that they're bad and Republicans are good. I dislike both parties equally. But you could see it to where the Democrats would say, well, we want to hold off on this next stimulus package because if it goes through, then that's going to be better for the other side of the aisle. I also want to point out for everyone watching this that the Fed put could be expired. Whenever I'm on Twitter, the, the rebuttal you always get for stocks going down is, oh, that'll never happen because the Fed will just come in and buy everything. They'll just do more quantitative easing. So the stock market will never go down again. We'll never have a bear market because the Fed can just print up all the money and buy stuff. But that's not exactly true. If we go back and remember what happened in March, uh, the, remember the Fed met that Sunday prior to the, the Wednesday meeting, they had that emergency 100 basis point cut. And the market still tanked. It, it, I think it was you know, the, the the futures tanked the next day. It was just the the bottom fell out of it, and the market really didn't start to quote unquote recover until the government came in and started this fiscal plan. And so I, I think maybe, and I'd love to get your guys' opinion on this. We've gone from a Fed put that's expired. And now we're at a government or a fiscal put, and that's the only game in town, which would be far more inflationary than a Fed put, could, because you're comparing bank reserves to money that's actually being spent directly in the economy. You make a really good point. And so partly, I think the Fed is basically, you know, we know what their tools are, and they don't really have any others. So we, we you can you can kind of... Um, figure out what you know if the market goes down what tools do they have what are they likely going to do i think it's a fair call to say that they will do whatever it takes so they've promised us that and and right. you know so there is some credence to that um but the reality is on the main street this is that doesn't solve that particular problem so again we've got this disconnect between wall street and main street and between the stock market and the and um, and how it's valued in the in the real market, and that's really where the rubber meets the road because that is partly, I guess, also why you're seeing civil unrest, right? Um, the vast majority of people don't have a stock portfolio. So fine if you're sitting at home and you lost your job and your stock portfolio is going through the roof, you might be okay with that. Um, on the other hand, if you don't have a stock portfolio or you have a very you know, one that's not significant enough, then it is a massive issue. And so I think the fiscal side of things, as Lynn, you pointed out, I think that's, I think that has to happen. Um, and there's another interesting dynamic there because this isn't just a US centric issue. This is across the world. And if we look at Europe, for example, they've, they're looking at doing the same thing. The difference in Europe is that in order for them to implement any, any particular policies, it needs to go through hundreds of, you know, point issues that will, you know, um, all have their own bloody ideas and, um, and and concessions that want to be made and so on and so forth. So the point is, I think they'll get there, but they're just going to take a much longer period of time to get there. In the US, on the other hand, it's much more easy to implement um, various policies. And I think the next um, step is going to need to be something like UBI, which to a certain extent you already have. Um, so that puts money direct, because if you think about fiscal, like fiscal normally used to be things like, oh, let's go and you know, rebuild JFK airport or, or something of that nature, right? And you, you could have a politician who, like a dog peeing in a tree, could go, oh, this is mine, and I can put my name up on it, and, <laughs> and I built this, you know. And that's what they do. But but the the need to actually get this into place and, and to also get all of the, um, the various, you know, 
bureaucracies to agree to get all this done. I think it might be trumped um, by um, by just you know shortcutting that and literally just giving people capital instead of going and building rebuilding infrastructure. So when you when you think about fiscal, fiscal can also just be UBI or what's yes. you know universal basic income, and that is that is that is a form of fiscal. And then if you think about that, is that inflationary or deflationary? Well, if you add a, like, dollars are just a, a unit of productivity, right? So if you add a unit of productivity without any commensurate productivity, then I've, I've, I find it difficult to, to see how that would be deflationary. So, um, but, but certainly then the question is also, okay, wait, where does that capital get spent? And that's where I don't, I don't think it's really an inflation deflation debate. It's like, we've had inflation for the last 20 odd years in, in, in financial assets. We've had it in healthcare. We've had it in all of the, basically the things that you couldn't outsource. And we've had deflation as a consequence of globalization, um, in, in technology goods, in, you know, the, the crap that we're wearing, all the, all the things that essentially we could pull in this, this massive labor pool um, from um, emerging markets. And so there will be, there will likely be both because consumption um, and spending habits are, are going to decline for sure. I mean, like there's just going to be less money available to go out to have that restaurant dinner. And um, so there, there, but it, you know, there will be a corrective measure like my, um, my friend and client who has restaurants, he's closing restaurants. So that's, that's a demand destruction as well as a supply destruction. Um, but certainly you're adding more productive units while at the same time you're, um, I mean, I mean it's, it's almost like Maslow's hierarchy of needs to a certain extent. It's back to Lord of the Flies. Like, what do you need? Um, how ironic would it be if the government comes out with U official UBI, let's say, that's even more extensive than what they're doing now with the increased unemployment benefits, and everyone just takes the UBI and buys stock with it? So <laughs> it becomes a fiscal quantitative easing. Just You can't get away from QE. That's all people do with the money that the Fed is printing or the government is spending is they just drive it right back into the stock market and make the bubble bigger and bigger and bigger. Who knows? It, crazier things have, have happened. I don't put anything. Nothing's uh, off the table right now in the world that's it, as insane as it is. This morning, in fact, it was so just I was pulling my hair out that I had to tweet that uh, that gif of Will Ferrell in uh, in Zoolander where he says I, I feel like I'm taking crazy pills <laughs> and I said the tweet was whenever I look at the news or the stock market this is exactly how I feel and it just um, I think that sums it up perfectly. So we know the problems, we know what's going on, but what can people do to protect themselves? What can they do to continue to hopefully not only survive, but thrive in this world of economic insanity? I'll listen to you, George. <laughs> that's right. Join Rebel Capitalist Pro. <laughs> that's that's the no brainer, right? But uh, what what do you guys think? I know that both of you are very bullish gold. And uh, and I'm assuming silver as well. Uh, Bitcoin, I think both of you are, are bullish there. But as far as just the uncertainty that we have in the stock market, I mean, what on earth can people do? Are there sectors that you think are still cheap where people might be able to find some value and not have to chase after something that they're trying to buy at a high price and sell it to a greater fool at even a higher price? Uh, what do you think? And when you guys end, I'll kind of give my spin on it and what I suggest people do. Ladies first. I've generally found uh, a little bit more um, value in some of the more cyclical companies because uh, not all of them, though, because some of them have been hit a lot harder, whereas many of the non-cyclical companies have been bid up to extraordinarily high valuations. So uh, part of my research is that I, I kind of go through individual companies and find ones that have, like, say, the strongest balance sheets in their industries uh, that have high returns on invested capital, uh, that have a good track record of getting through recessions, you know, without major equity dilution or other kind of permanent capital destruction. 
so I found some, uh, you know, opportunities in that that more value oriented sector. Uh, but you know, by sticking to the more conservative side of that of that value sector, rather than, for example, you know, people speculating on like the most leveraged oil company or the most leveraged airline or the, you know, that that's the kind of speculation that I'm avoiding. But uh, some of the stronger aspects, the stronger areas of the cyclical sectors, uh, in addition to as you mentioned, the the precious metals and potentially the, the Bitcoin, uh, for people that uh, can stomach the volatility. Um, I'm also using treasuries as uh, somewhat of a counter cyclical approach, right? So even though I don't particularly like, uh, you know, real treasury return for uh, potential over the next, say, call it five or 10 years, I do like short term treasuries as um, kind of a hedge when we start to get this, this, you know, overbought condition in the market, right? So when we went into this, this crisis, I had, you know, a certain amount of treasuries in my portfolios. And then uh, in March, we took a little bit of treasuries out of the portfolio and put in a little bit of equity exposure. And then earlier this week, we we dialed it back, right? So we took a little bit of uh, equity stake out, put a little more in treasuries, even though I'm not particularly, I don't particularly like treasuries as an asset class. It's kind of a vol volatility shock absorber, right? So uh, that's kind of a good way to get dry powder on the side so that you can redeploy it when we get kind of an oversold condition uh, and to kind of just, just whatever volatility does at any given time, I try to be a little bit on the opposite side of that and then look for opportunities either to, to kind of take some chips off the table or to kind of make uh, you know a little, little bit more aggressive bets on some of the companies that I've, I've vetted pretty well. What maturity do you usually use, Lynn? Uh, so I have, I have uh, a couple different sets. So one is, uh, one, uh, is less than a year, and then the other one is kind of the one to three year time frame. Uh, the longer end can make for a little bit stronger hedge but I, I prefer to stay out of the longer end and I prefer to stay in the shorter end. Yeah, I always tell people that if you're going to have dry powder, you want to be super safe and you're very skeptical of the bank as a counterparty risk, just go into three month T-bills or something. Just keep rolling them over. So you get a little bit, you might have some upside with some capital appreciation, but you can always get your money back and then just continue to roll it over or take it out and buy something that's cheap. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you, Lynn, before we move on to Chris, is how do you determine if something is cheap or if it's expensive? Uh, partially it comes down to discounted cash flows, right? So I, I kind of make a model for what I think they're, that they're likely to do over the next, you know, call it five or 10 years. Uh, and then you go from there, and then also look back and see what is their what is their valuation been over the past five, ten, twenty years, and to see how it compares. It, you know, if my if my thesis plays out, I take a kind of a conservative version of what I think is going to happen, and I say, okay, what would the returns be if I if I buy it at this valuation? This kind of you know somewhat more bearish scenario plays out, and then I can sell it at this valuation in five or ten years. What does that look like in terms of returns and how does that compare to what I think I can get from the S&P 500? How does that compare to uh, holding it in T-bills that whole time? How does that compare to, uh, you know, how much precious metal exposure I want to have? Uh, so I kind of I kind of take a very fundamental view uh, to, to buy companies that have I generally focus on companies that have high returns on invested capital, uh, fairly low valuations relative to their history and that have preferably some some type of growth in there, even though uh, the amount of growth I look for depends on the valuation I'm, I'm willing to accept. So I'm, you know, if, if I'm looking at a higher growth company, I pay up a higher valuation. Uh, and I, for, for that kind of company, I use like the, the peg ratio, like so uh, price divided by earnings divided by growth. So I, that's kind of the Peter Lynch, uh, you know, famous metric. Uh, so a couple different kind of valuation approaches, depending on the type of company it is. And then how do you layer macro over that? Uh, mainly for asset allocation. So when it comes to how much overall equity exposure I want to have, uh, okay. you know, if I'm, if I'm expecting kind of a more deflationary crunch in asset prices, like we're seeing you know, t uh, today, or if I'm expecting like a more reflationary move, uh, that, that kind of is, is my overall asset allocation. And then in addition, uh, because I look at individual countries, right? So I look at their currency situations. I look at their overall like debt levels for that country. And I look at all the different kind of areas of opportunity or areas of excessive risk. So that can kind of, if I'm going to pick, say, a bank stock or a beer stock or something like that, certain countries might, I might kind of go into certain countries more than others, depending on their macro situation. 
Okay, understood. And just for all the viewers, just so you know, Lynn posts her personal portfolio along with her research, and we're going to include all of that in Rebel Capitalist Pro. But we'll get into the pitch in just a moment here. Uh, Chris, same types of questions. How do you measure value and how do you determine whether or not something is cheap or expensive. And also one thing I, I forgot to ask you, Lynn, but I think it's very important people understand your timing and your time frame for your investment decisions. I interviewed Juliet de Klerk the other day and you know she says, well, I'm bullish on this, I'm bullish on that. But then people think they kind of layer over their own time frame and think that she's referring to that. So if their time frame is 10 years, and she's saying she's bullish, they think she's talking about 10 years when she could be talking about the next 10 days or something like that. So, it, you know, your time frame is extremely, extremely important. So if you guys could expand on that as well, please. Yeah, for me, my my kind of base time frame for an individual stock is about five years, right? Okay. So it's possible that I would sell it before then, it's possible I would he hold it for longer than them. But that that's kind of my base assumption when I'm, when I'm looking at how long I want to hold an investment for. Okay. Uh, now and then, but layering on to that, some of the macro stuff, like how much asset allocation I want, that that partially depends on you know overall sentiment in the market, how how overbought or or oversold we are at any given time. So some of my asset allocation decisions can be more you know based on months, uh, okay. whereas whereas my individual kind of uh, company level selections are more multi year based. But then how much exposure I want to have to like that set of companies is is kind of more multi-month based. Got it. Chris, what do you think? How do you determine if yeah. something's cheap or expensive? Well, firstly, time frame is pretty much the same as Lynn. Um, I think okay. it's just, you know, we've we've, we've had a, a, a bizarro world for the last, um, it's just got increasingly bad ever since I've been in the business and that's over 20 years now, where your holding time frames have just become vanishingly thin and most people are really just, you know, markets part of it's algo driven and then there's just a lot of retail pl players and none of them have any real um ability to hold anything for longer than i think the current holding period is under four months um wow. and you go back to like the 60s it was over 10 years so we basically go the other way and and you know the reality is that in most instances a company's fortunes don't change within a four month time frame um, that's just silly. It's really just noise, whatever you get in, the, in within a four month time frame. So um, 100% on board with, with what Lynn was saying there. In terms of determining um, you know, what is value, I take a similar approach. We'll look at the, the, the various metrics, but I think one of the things that, um, and, this, and this changed as a consequence of running venture capital business for some years was and I understand, trying to look at, at major cycles and how capital flows through any system. Um, you get often, um, you know, um, capital will move into um, into like venture capital, for example, and then it'll start moving through into the retail space if you have um, uh, in, in large sectors, you know. So like, and I think I've explained this before, you had like Alt Energy was one of the big things in sort of 04, 05, and then it kind of started flowing through into the, into the more liquid stock markets and you had listing of ETFs and you had synthetic products created by the investment bankers and all this kind of fun stuff. So you kind of have these big shifts of, of both technology and capital and all, all moving in one, in one go. And if you can get behind those trends, um, you, basically you can be lazy to a certain extent. You know, it's a little bit like, again, I come back to like when I started, you know, my, um, my career in, in the dot coms, like if I, if you had, if you had sort of, seen some of that the, the capital formation that was taking place well back in the early 90s um, and just got behind that trend um, and and realized also that it was just a trend and there was a whole lot of insanity going on you could have you could have done really well and so um, what we tend to look at doing is to is to find because we're very conservative we'll try and find um, in terms of deep value, we'll just look for sectors that have been absolutely decimated um, and then say, okay, why is it that they've been decimated? Are there any you know, fundamental reasons why that would continue? Um, is there a, a change in the dynamic and is this not being priced by the market? And then it's a matter of saying, okay, 
if that's a, if that's a sector that you are comfortable with and that's really you've got the macro overlay saying okay well, why is that sector the way it is you know is there is there some uh, macro play in, involved that's caused that to take place and then you look at that sector and then we we, we just want to be really conservative because we we know that timing is um is the most difficult of all um and so we'll try and always find companies that are just going to go that are going to make it through so we're looking for unlevered balance sheets we're looking for strong earnings um just very strong profitability um and and typically you know where that leads us has in in the last you know three four five years has led us towards ironically all the things that we were talking about at the start where we were saying okay you know what like you're saying you know you get a stimulus check what are you going to spend it on and i was saying it's like maslow's hierarchy of needs right and and if you look at the sectors that have been decimated that are really really cheap um many of them are in that space where on a relative basis if you know you can just pull up it will will create charts with respect to the valuation of these sectors relative to say the s p relative to the russell relative to the nasdaq and so we can kind of see where capital has has flowed into and where it hasn't um and in most instances we're buying the other side of it and hence our time frame being longer um because it can last for longer you know does the fed come in and just start buying all the nasdaq stocks it's it's possible they can do whatever the hell they want um but um so so that's kind of how we go about constructing the portfolio yeah got it and then as far as commodities when you guys try to figure out if they're expensive or cheap is, is it a different way of looking at it because there's not really cash flows it's not really a business or the same question for gold or Bitcoin, or, or do you see things, do you have the same approach or is it different? How does that work? Well, I guess you've got the commodity and then you've got the commodity companies and, and they right, never right. be, you know, confused. And so just on the commodity side of things, you just say, okay, well, what's the cost of production? You know, can mm -hmm. they produce this thing at a loss? Can they? And then you take above ground inventories and you say, okay, it's a little bit like FX reserves. You know, I used to do, um, uh, when I was cutting my teeth, I used to do forex trading. Um, so, you know, you'll look at countries and say, okay, especially dollar peg countries. Um, I had a mate who was at Deutsche years back, and he used to um, he he ran a he ran a um, like an ar a, an arbitrage um, uh, setup on on currencies, and then he, he had basically his tail end stuff, which he had about two percent, and was always um like pegs and things that were semi semi pegged um and that was just his asymmetric kind of like playoff um but in that respect he was always just looking and saying okay well, you know what is the underlying commodity because it's often commodity countries uh, oh, right. okay. you know that are that are pegging their currency not always but quite often and then you'd say okay well what's the what's the cost of production of that say it's oil like take right now our mine's a good example our mine's pretty fucked i mean they, they can't pay their bills so um and they're a dollar pig right so you take a country like that and say, okay, fine. Um, what's the cost of production? What is their overall cost? You're taking social spending, all that kind of stuff, and say, okay, the cost of production for them is uh, twenty dollars. And if the if the you know price of oil is nine, it's okay. What's the FX reserves look like? In other words, how long can they hold the peg? And what and you just build all these macro models on it. Um, and and so we I tend to like use a similar kind of um, modeling with respect to commodities and you say okay what is the what is the um, the cost of production how much is the that we know of above ground inventory what does demand look like what is the actual commodity and then and then if you can get comfortable with that commodity and you go well that's great then fine then you say well if you want leverage behind it then you can buy the equities and then you know similar approach we were looking and saying okay who's not who's going to survive that's the main thing it's like you you if you're going to ride that that massive trend you want to you don't want to be right about a sector and then cock it up because you bought the wrong company so we'll buy a bunch of different companies but we're always trying to find those that will first and foremost survive and you might go and take you know a half a percent position or something and something that's more levered and it's got you know potential but but for the most part um 
that's that's not how we go about it. For the viewers who don't know, I think Chris and his team are have a very similar mindset to me, where they think that uh, commodities are very cheap right now. I was talking to someone the other day that pointed out a chart that shows how the stock market compared to commodities, the 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 gap between them is at an all time high. So stocks are at an all time, um, I don't know how you should say it, you know, stocks are when you, are expensive compared to commodities or vice versa. And that gap has never been as extreme as it is today. So Lynn, how do you look at commodities? Uh, so for, for the monetary commodities, right? So if you take gold and then to some extent silver and Bitcoin, I do a lot of ratio comparisons to uh, the money supply because the whole thesis of a monetary metal, like let's gold is the primary example, is that it retains its value over the long term. It has these volatile periods, but essentially it maintains purchasing power, you know, from decade to decade. And uh, whereas, you know, let's call it dollars, let's say let's focus on the US, but it would apply to any country, as the number of dollars, especially dollars per capita, keeps expanding dramatically, but gold remains relatively fixed per capita. Uh, because the production rate is roughly the same as population growth. Uh, so I do a lot of ratio work to compare, okay, what is what is gold worth compared to how it was you know, in the 90s or how it was in the 1970s or even further back compared to how many dollars have been created since then, especially on a per okay. capita basis. So I do that ratio work. And then uh, I also look at things like gold to Dow ratio or gold to S&P 500 ratio uh, to see how you know, how does the how does the money supply compare to gold? How does the stock market compare to gold? How does uh, the overall credit market compare to gold? Because as we get uh, further into a long term debt cycle, uh, the whole I'm sure you've heard of uh, Exer's pyramid, right? Which is like the inverse pyramid that shows if you start from the bottom, you have like gold and then you have cash. And as you go up, you get into these larger and larger sections of the financial system, right? So you get into credit, you get into equities and Towards the end of a long-term debt cycle, like we're at now, the the pyramid is very wide, but it's inverted, which make which means when it's wide, it's more unstable, right? Mm -hmm. So, when that uh, you know long-term debt cycle unwinds and they do a large currency devaluation, it generally narrows the pyramid, which means a lot of money printed compared to the amount of gold in the system, and even compared to the the amount of credit in the system. When when you're comparing money supply to gold, are you using broad money or base money? I do a couple of different methods, uh, but primarily I use broad money. I find that the the more accurate um, uh, depictor. Okay. And just for definition, guys, that would be the M2 money supply. All right. Well, we've almost at an hour. So we'll go ahead and wrap it up right there. I don't want to keep you guys too long. I appreciate your time. For any of the viewers who would like more of this type of content. This is what we're going to be doing on a weekly basis. Myself, Lynn, and Chris, plus you're going to get their incredible research. And we've got an amazing online forum just for the members. So if you want to find out more about that, and we've got a special introductory price as well, you can go ahead and click and follow the link below and you'll see some more videos talking head of me telling you all about the product. So I can't wait to see each and every one of you back over on the other side in Rebel Capitalist Pro.